Welcome to McGuire's Car Crazy. It doesn't matter if you're a guy or gal, if you love cars, you're a car guy. And this is Car Crazy Central shouting the passion that 30 million of us who are car guys across America and tens of millions more around the world share in common, no matter what kind of cars we love. Join us as we focus on this emotion of being car crazy. Welcome to Car Crazy Central, ground zero for monitoring the major events and personalities of the car hobby around the world. Each week we creatively serve up a full menu of car crazy passion for you to enjoy via our car crazy television and radio shows, as well as on demand through our website, carcrazycentral.com. Our mission is pure and simple, that's right, we want to make you just a little more this will get the car crazy, guys. We're using the concept of pit stop. So when airplanes land now, when they go to their spot on the flight deck, they're serviced completely. Their bombs, fuel, everything. We're going to uh, what I call them the jalopy races, which was a dirt track at the Merced County Fairgrounds. Right? We went there every Saturday night, and we watched these guys race. And my favorite airplane, actually, is the F-18. I think from a standpoint of handling, I'll go back to car crazy. Yeah. It's an airplane that just handles incredibly well. It has great flying qualities to it. And now our host, Barry McGuire. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another very special edition of McGuire's Car Crazy. I know I always say that, but this one, this one is absolutely unbelievable. We're here at the Naval Air Station on North Island in San Diego, and uh, you think about the men who stand in harm's way and, and keep our freedom so we can enjoy all these car guy events. The U.S. Navy does that in such incredible ways. Admiral John Nathman is the commander of U.S. Fleet Forces Command. That's correct, yes. He is, he's the man that runs our, our naval forces, all, all the vessels all over the world. And it's just, I, 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 I sit and think of all that you have going on at any given time. And here you are hanging out with us today, talking about cars. Eddie's such a car guy. Welcome to the show. Thank you very, thank you very much. Ed, I appreciate it. Well, as my staff knows, I like to have uh, speed vision on all the time. And <laughs> yeah. Did you get that, everybody at Speed? All, everybody runs Speed Channel, all our friends there. He's watching Speed Channel. He has a splash screen at his office in Norfolk. And, I just right. get Naval Forces in the United States ready for, <laughs> for deployment. That, and so that's and, a, the, and the readiness for that. Just what a huge exactly. job. Explain okay, explain that for us because well, it's it's it, uh, it's it's amazing what you do. Exactly. What everyone should know is we have great men and women that do their job incredibly well and I have very good commanders that work for me. And so one of the things I feel as I do is mostly synchronization about what's the right way, what's the training level we need to be at, how do you synchronize forces in an integrated way so we we feel that's our mission can you give us some idea of the size i mean how many vessels how many personnel well there's uh right now there's about three hundred and forty thousand men and women in this in the naval service uh there's a great number of reserves uh we have some worldwide right now we have several tens of thousands of men and women deployed on different expeditionary groups it's unbelievable the integrity of young people that you have it, coming in the military. It truly is. They really, you watch them mature, you watch them gain really skills, skills, technical skills, but they start gaining leadership skills and they, they really find out who they are sometimes yeah. in the military. Yeah. And I personally don't believe uh, a career, every person should make a career out of, the, out of the service. I believe one of the things that are doing that's really important is that they're living up, I think, to the obligation of being an American citizen by serving. Yeah. And they don't necessarily have to be in the Navy to do that, the armed services. But there's, there's many citizens, young men and women, that really miss that opportunity mm -hmm. to, to be part of this country and to serve. And I think that's a very so important true. part. And so you watch them, Barry, you watch them mature, you watch them grow, and you become very proud of them because they really do provide the capabilities, the deck plate capability. When you watch a young man or woman on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier push a 60,000 pound jet, get it up to that catapult, make sure it's ready to go, that jet doesn't go off that catapult. Even though I've done that a lot, but I don't go off the catapult um, without a bunch of men and women behind right. me that get it ready. And, and, and knowing you can trust them. <laughs> yes, and, try, and they're, yeah. they do a great job. Yeah. Behind every good young man and woman in the Navy is good parents, yeah. <laughs> generally. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's a very important part because I think they're brought up the right way. And we, we get a chance to kind of share that and then build on it. That's what I think I appreciate uh, so much about our young men and women. 
We're at the Coronado Speed Festival with Admiral John Nathman, and he's going to tell us how the experience of racing vintage cars <laughs> is like flying an F-18 fighter jet right after this break. Through a car guy's eyes, you've had some fun jobs. You've, you've had some incredible, I mean, I think in Top Gun school and whatever. Help us understand some, some of the things that you've, you've well, done. I, there's a lot of uh, discipline and processes and learning that go in. And like anything else, like, like race car driving or anything like that, you may have great skills, but you've got to really get, you got to get seat time, you got to get book time, sure. and you got to get some sure. experience, and you have to have mentors. You have to have people that say, you could do this better, or sometimes tell you you're not doing it so well. And it reminded me of that because yesterday I had a chance to drive a car, and I, I went around with a coach, Jeff, <laughs> and he helped me a lot because he was very, he was very, he critiqued me. And I really appreciate that because it was teaching, a, teaching you the law. He line. was, and it, it was a process I was familiar with. Not, not necessarily the skills, but the process <laughs> was familiar. <laughs> so I really enjoyed it. You made a funny statement to me before we turned the cameras on about how it was more difficult to race a car than it was to fly a plane. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> the difference is it's the same discipline in many ways. It's about being on a limit. It's about really understanding how to optimize the performance of that particular airplane or car. So the process seems pillar, but I think the real distinction is that when you're racing, you're doing maybe 30, 40 minutes, 24 hours of very much on a limit. In aviation, you may be on a limit for maybe you know, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes of an hour of a mission where you're actually delivering weapons or you're landing on aircraft carrier or typically high stress events. And that's when you typically feel you're on a limit of that air, airframe or when you're engaged in air combat yeah. maneuvering. Yeah. So one of my experiences in, in aviation was I was an instructor at Navy Fighter Weapons School. Everybody calls it Top Gun, but I was there for two and a half years and I basically flew my rear end off. I was flying almost two to three missions a day. And so you become, you become kind of an expert at it. I, you could fly and you could, it, it reminds me of what I hear about race car drivers. I remember I could, I knew if it was at 6.5 or 6.6 .6 Gs, I knew it, to a tenth of the G I knew where I was. And you kind of knew where your airplane was all the time in terms of its airspeed and its ability to do certain things. I often ask the question, what was your car craziest driving experience? So if I could take a play of that, what was your car craziest flying experience? <laughs> well, my, my, it occurred not too far from here. I. I was doing a test top in an A4 at Top Gun, and, and uh, you have to pull the, when you do a test top, you're supposed to pull the flight controls and fly it manually for the last 15 minutes. And normally it's a hydraulic system, but this was like a casualty for combat uh, damage. And I pulled it, and the airplane wasn't rigged very well, and I did a really slow barrel roll at about 300 knots right over La Jolla, which is, uh, I thought I was gonna, thought I was gonna eject. So I, I, the lucky thing was the airplane kind of barrel rolled so slow it went nose high wow. and was able to fly it slow enough that I could get the gear and flaps partway down and land it. But I, that was the one time I got very uncomfortable. My, my real experience in aviation was I never really had any bad emergencies. I've, you know, I've almost a little bit over 4,000 hours in all tactical jets. and You've flown them all? Uh, I think not all, but a lot. What, what's your favorite? My favorite airplane actually is the F-18. I, I think from a standpoint of handling, I'll go back to car crazy. Yeah. It's an airplane that just handles incredibly well. It has great flying qualities to it. It is an airplane that where the weapon systems work all the time. And it's multi-mission. It can do strike, it can do air to air. And it has these beautiful flying qualities around an aircraft carrier as well in, in air to air. The first time you catapulted off a carrier, can you, can you th remember what that was like the first time you sit there? It was actually, like... I do. Uh, it was in T-28, so I didn't actually get catapulted. I actually did a deck launch. Really? T-28 was a Trojan trainer. It was oh, a okay. Uh, okay. radial engine, uh, two-place airplane, and uh, we landed on the Lexington off of Pensacola, and then after that, you taxied off, and you just did a deck run like World War II. Was, uh, the guys returned with little no, flags. Sure. And it was the first time you got to use the full manifold air pressure on the airplane. It was. 48 inches, I remember on the takeoff or on land, you could use 52 and a half on the carrier deck. And so it was the first time I got to use all that power. <clears throat> so we did a deck launch. I don't think there's many pilots left active duty now in the Navy with a deck launch. Don't go away. When we come back, Admiral Nathman gets personal about his cars, his dad, and being a car guy all of his life, right here on McGuire's Car Crazy.
on top of all this immense thing, I really want to put it in perspective with all the responsibilities. Now we'll just go back and talk about, you know, experiences that we've all shared so much together. Exactly. You were a car guy at heart when you were a kid. So let's go back to some of the, the childhood experiences. Well, my that. father was a master sergeant in the Air Force, and so he fixed B-52s. And he actually started, he joined the Army Air Corps in 38, and obviously before Pearl Harbor, and had some very interesting experiences. But we ended up at Castle Air Force Base, where the B-52 came in. And my dad was pretty special at that time because the airplane uh, needed a lot of, the bombing navigation system was very important to the B-52, obviously, and sure. it turned out he was really an expert in fixing it, so we stayed there for eight years, and so I grew up in the San Joaquin Valley, and that's car country right there, yeah. so, you yeah, know, we're talking about Merced, Modesto, <laughs> Turlock, and I remember going to uh, what I call them the jalopy races, which was a yeah. dirt track at the Merced County Fairground. Right? We went there every Saturday <laughs> night, great. and we watched these guys race. And oh my goodness! The, I can't remember. We had some guys that came in from out of town. Used to kick their rear end, and so my father obviously is a mechanic. He helped build a go kart for us. It built a, it was pretty rugged. It wasn't what you, but it was a go kart with the Briggs and Stratton. And I remember one day I took it apart thinking I could want to figure out what it yeah, was. And yeah. my big mistake was I took the cylinder off and and my dad said, now you get to put it back together, except I couldn't figure out how to get it to go over the ring, you know? So <laughs> I couldn't get it to work. <laughs> so I, I got, what's it called? I got embarrassed and uh, my but dad a great said, learning experience. this is how you do it. So yeah. I, I've really been a grease torque wrench guy my whole life. So my first car was um, that I purchased was a 1970 Boss 302. And I loved it, and I made the mistake of selling it like we all yeah, do, because yeah, we don't know any better. Isn't that the truth? And then a series of different cars, and a ZR1 a Corvette 90, uh, which was a really big experience to me. Uh, just about the size of that and the unique handling characteristics yeah. of it. Yeah. I spun it out a couple of times. Good. And, uh, <laughs> and now I, I, I have a three series coupe, Beamer coupe, which I just enjoy for the balance of the car. It's just yeah. a nice car. The association between car guys and people that are of the U.S. Navy, there's there's yeah. a real close affinity there. Well, I think you've seen, you know, you've been, you've watched uh, our carriers work a day and night. And if you got to the squadron level of organizational maintenance, you would find the same process that you see in the pits or in the paddock. I mean, the checklist, the way the cars are prepared, the the equipment in many ways is the same sort of equipment, and you'd recognize the process immediately because it's a very disciplined process about how to get a car or an airplane set up. This will get the car crazy, guys. We're using the concept of pit stop. So when airplanes land now, when they go to their spot on the flight deck, they're serviced completely. Their bombs, fuel, everything. It used to be sometimes you'd respot the airplanes after you recovered, and we found a way by changing the size and the configuration of the flight deck to make the flight deck much more efficiently. The catapults, we getting no longer have steam catapults. We're going to electromagnetic catapults. Oh, I've heard about this. So the same oh, thing, yeah, I've heard so when you go this. on those rides, those yeah. Disney World rides yeah. that shoot you up there, it's the same <laughs> concept, just bigger. <laughs> Would you believe there's a Top Gun pilot and Navy Admiral who races go-karts? <laughs> Stay with us for this amazing story from the Coronado Speed Festival in San Diego, California, right after this break. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. We're here with Admiral Nathlin, commander of U.S. Fleet Forces Command. Wonderful experience. Super car guy. I know you have a lot of car crazy experiences. Any particular you'd like to, to share with us, John? Well, I, I think uh, my experiences in go-karting are illustrative of just being a little bit too car crazy sometimes. I I try to probably go too rapidly into up the classes of go-karting and ended up in shifters right away. Yeah, and I, yeah. I have a stock Honda shifter that I raced with, with started with Alex Barron when I started in shifters up in North County up here in Temecula, Paris, and Namago and places like that. To me, it's been how, you know, the, getting exposed to different tracks, how you know, learning the tempo of, of car racing. And then I had the opportunities because of that to get into, you know, get invited to get into different cars. Uh, Mr. Tom Milner for PTG Racing mm -hmm. uh, back in Winchester, Virginia. Uh, we met uh, through Rudd Cunningham and I had a chance to go out and get into one of their older cars and go around Summit oh, and yeah. go around with Joey oh, yeah. Hand and with his son, Tom Milner. And uh, that was a great time for me. And uh, you know how it is. These guys are really race car drivers. 
and they're telling me, well, you do this, you do that, and you're, you get into this brain fade after a while <laughs> where your, your vision's about this big. Some of the feelings you have for being a car guy, of course, you, you want to look good, but you also want to go fast, high yes. performance, have that yeah. rush, you know, all that. Speak to that, Cameron. There's a lot of car guys out there that probably flirted with the military going uh -huh. in, in the Navy and, and whatever. What would you say to them? Why, why should they join the U.S. Navy? First of all, it's a young game. Uh, the military is a young game because you want to get in it, uh, one, to maybe change your, your qualifications because there's a great experience in learning the service yeah. technically sure. from a number of disciplines. Mine just happened to be aviation, but yeah. there's... The IT world is a, an explosion oh right now in oh the military. Yeah, the best of the best. Yeah, you do, and you you do real missions, and it's really interesting to watch our young men, men and women sit. I was in Fort Gordon, uh, Georgia, watching them deliver targeting to Iraq. See, that's what's really interesting, and it's real time. It's wow. it's happening now. Sit there and watch it. So that was very interesting. That's just not made for TV. Television series or whatever that really no, that, that really, really ha it really happens it's happening right now. Well, thank you, John, for hosting us today. Sure, thank this you is very a much. special treat. It's going to be a fabulous day. We'll catch you out there in the track a little bit later on. I know you got to run. All right. Really, really special. Admiral Nathman, Commander, U.S. Fleet Force, sitting here talking about his car guy experiences. This is awesome. All right. Really thanks, Terry. <laughs> Back right. with more right after this break. Let's find out how car crazy you are. Import car makers like Toyota, Nissan, and BMW are now building cars in the United States in plants in Kentucky, Tennessee, and South Carolina. However, this is not a new phenomenon. Three major European car makers were producing cars in the U.S. over 80 years ago. Our question for you is this. Which of the following European car manufacturers did not build cars in America during those early years? Was it A, Austin Healey, B, Fiat, C, Mercedes-Benz, or D, Rolls-Royce? We'll find out right after this break, right here on Meguiar's Car Crazy. We want to know how car crazy you are. Import car makers like Toyota, Nissan, and BMW are now building cars in the United States in plants in Kentucky, Tennessee, and South Carolina. However, this is not a new phenomenon. Three major European car makers were producing cars in the U.S. over 80 years ago. Our question for you is this. Which of the following European car manufacturers did not build cars in America during those early years? Was it A, Austin Healey, B, Fiat, C, Mercedes-Benz, or D, Rolls-Royce? Well, Fiat actually produced cars in Poughkeepsie, New York from 1910 to 1918. Mercedes-Benz built cars on Long Island, New York from 1905 to 1907. Rolls-Royces were built in Springfield, Massachusetts from 1919 all the way up to 1935, although it wasn't mass production. The right answer is A. Austin Healey, who never built cars in America. Austin Healey built cars from 1953 to 1972, and all of them were built in England. And if you knew this piece of homegrown trivia, you must be car crazy. And now our host, Barry McGuire. I love reading all your letters because it really gives me a snapshot of all different parts of the hobby. This one comes from a new car, car guy. His name's Carlos Santos. He lives in Canada. He writes, what a show you got. I thought I was the only person in this world obsessed with cars until I saw your show. Now I realize that I'm normal, and this bug we car guys carry with us is normal, and actually we are blessed to have this disease. I'm making a point to wake up early every Sunday morning so I do not miss your show. I was on a waiting list for a Shelby Mustang GT500 for over a year. I got all the things done around the house, especially in the garage, getting insulated, heated, and ready for my baby to come home. Well, on December 21st, 
2007, my dream came true. I picked up my baby and she's now sleeping in the garage until old Frosty leaves town and let spring roll in. I hope you read this note because you really touch a special place in my heart and for that, I want to thank you. When I picked up the car, the salesperson commented about the expression on my face. I think I actually teared up when I saw my car for the first time. I owe the purchase of this car to my dad. He knows how much it means to me. He's my idol and I really look up to him. Once again, Barry, thanks for making all of us car guys realize that being car crazy is normal. Your friend forever, Carlos Santos. Well, thank you, Carlos, for your kind remarks and for recognizing how blessed all of us are who were born <laughs> with the car crazy gene. And if you don't know about the car crazy gene and the technical research we've done on it using electromolecular imaging, you can find it on our website, carcrazycenter.com. And if you're a car guy, you need this information. You really do. <laughs> and Carlos, you've given me the opportunity to point out that not all car guys are old car guys. Most of us are, and a lot of us are both old old car and new car guys, but some are like you, Carlos, totally into newer cars. And I must say, I'm overwhelmed by how many new car guy type cars are on the market today at all price levels. We used to be able to cover all the car guy type new cars with our cameras at the Detroit Auto Show in one day. This year, we spent two days covering the show and still didn't get them all in. And that's probably the best indicator possible that the car hobby has reached critical mass. There are now so many of us that every single car maker is being forced to introduce cars with high performance and great style to entice us into their showrooms. It's a great day for new car car guys, and quite frankly, for a new crop of collector cars 20 years from now. And Carlos, the new Shelby Mustang GT500 is truly one of the very best. I talked with Carol Shelby about the GT500 when it was first unveiled, and I knew it had to be a great car because he was so excited about it, and that says a lot. Yeah, you're gonna have a blast when the warm weather comes, and by connecting with us today emotionally, you have made all of us just a little bit more car crazy. And for the rest of you, I want you to know that I personally read every car crazy confession that we receive, and you know what? Every single one of them is so, so special. If you haven't sent me your story yet, why not do it this week? Send your email to confessions at carcrazycentral.com. Thanks for watching our show this week because this episode and every episode is intended to make you just a little bit more car crazy. <laughs>